Cool. So I wanted to show you guys just a couple like fun things behind the scenes, other takes, other like pieces that I've been working on. Um, so let's see here. So this opening shot right here that you see coming up, um, originally I had that as um, myself nude above the water instead. You see this coming up over here on the screen on your left. Um, and uh, so I just thought that was an interesting alternative shot. I'm just trying to kind of jump right into this. The director's um, cut. Here's like unrated. Yeah. Here's me trying to like you know trying it out and, and falling <laughs> off the uh, table there. That was good times. Um, and so man, I feel like this thing's going too fast. But so here's the what we actually shot. Ended up using uh, was this doll, and that's kind of the setup we use there. Um, I'll just move past. And then uh, one thing I wanted to talk about. I don't have time to move really fast on this thing because it's getting ahead of me. But um, I kind of just using parts and pieces around me and uh, working in my wife's studio, Ashley's studio. And so I stole these little, um, the universe that she did for this piece. Um, what was the name of the piece? Cat sarcophagus. So, um, and then you see, you'll see, you saw those at the beginning of the, the world moving around. So that's kind of a interesting tidbit I wanted to throw in. Here's how we did the, um, trees being put down in there, just kind of, um, let's see, here you can kind of see them hanging from this pole. Um, so the strings kind of attaching it, and then I just lowered the entire pole, or actually raised it and then reversed it. And uh, I'm trying to keep up with this thing. All right, and so here's like a little guy. We'll, we'll get to more conceptual stuff as we get in here. <laughs> All this technical stuff is at the beginning. Um, and so, and this is like the building of the room that he's in. You can see the Ashley and I worked almost like 50% on this piece, working together on this. Um, and, uh, and that little guy is actually a really funny story. We found him <laughs> on Richard Simmons' site. So he sells these guys for $10 a piece. Uh, and they're like, they're people from his childhood that he knew. And he had them like commissioned to be made, and <laughs> now he just sells them for. I don't know. They're amazing. I want to buy all of them. They're like they're so cool, uh, but and they would just work perfectly for what we were doing in the scale. So um, here's an early sketch of the um, bird um, with gears and whatnot. Um, I did this summer before I shot this scene. Um, I wanted to put a giraffe in a pool. Like this is kind of how I work. Is like I I come up with the craziest idea ever, it's and then for bubbles. oh, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, yeah. um, pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to you know, sort of use a elephant, but I never was able to put that together either. But I I kind of work for these like larger ideas, and then try to narrow them down into something that I can do in my own house with my own money. Um, and. Here's some of the early shots of some of these pieces. Uh, you can see I'd, I eventually kind of learned that like, uh, like just with experimenting, if I put it on glass, I can light it in a way that makes it completely black uh, behind it. Um, what's that? Oh man, we're already in my bowl. All right, moving faster. Should I pause it, do you think? Sure. Should we pause it and then talk? Pause it. Okay, let's pause it. There's no rules. Where's the pausing button? <laughs> it's in the remote that you just. I don't know what it is. Where's that remote? Oh, you have it. Thank you. I left it over there. All right, I'll pause it so we can talk about this, because Chris has a lot of interesting things to say as well. OK, cool. Um, all right, and here's the fish. Um, and my cat really enjoyed this, <laughs> this suit. Um, so it was just like a LED flat panel behind a fish tank, basically, and then uh, reverse that out. Um, this is my computer setup that I had <laughs> when I was working. I, the computer I was working was like so old and it, it couldn't handle it. So I got, I got a new computer, but I was like working so furiously I didn't really have time to like set up. So I just stuck it in front of the other computer <laughs> and kept working. Uh, we worked on a lot of deadlines. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, oh, and the, that salt that you saw back there, I'll just rewind a little bit. 
or the, the, the birds flocking, uh, that's actually salt on, a, on, card, on construction paper um, that I just moved around and lit in a way that to make, that, make them move like birds, like I've seen them observed. Can I bring that back? Oh, I see. I always use the wrong button. We're gonna we're gonna slow down here in a second. It'll be less intense. So you you can see over here. Yeah. So like that. This this salt area here. This is like that. So it's and then we'll get into some of that other background later. Um, and there's the bird. I think I have a shot of the bird. Nope, I don't. Okay. Chris, do you want to talk about some of the stuff for sure. the first one? I'm, not, I'm done so talking for a little with, bit. So with uh, with creation, we were this went through a lot of phases, and this score probably had the most cutouts in it. So we originally had like the music was. I made all the music first for this film. We decided to try to do this different ways for each one. Jericho, you'll see there, like, he made all the film first and then I made the music to it. But this one, all the music was first. And I had, I think, eight minutes of music. And Paul was like, we, I don't have eight minutes of film. I'm not making eight minutes of film. So I said, okay. Yeah, stop frame animation takes a little longer. But we, longer. you know, kind of, and we knew that we were going to do this live for a long time. And so our original idea was we were fixated with this idea of how, you know, the Bible describes creation as this, more God-centered, kind of organic thing, whereas when we think of um, the way that humans rationalize theories, that we kind of put things in compartments, and so if you think about like Darwin's theory of evolution, it's very, even though it's describing a very organic thing, sometimes it seems very cold and very dry, and that's hence kind of all the clocks and the mechanics inside of the animals. And so our original thought and the basis for the whole piece was that we would have this giant clock on stage that we were going to make or find, probably going to make, because it was going to like be as tall as the screen, and it was just going to like tick. And that was going to be the metronome for the whole piece. Well, we decided we didn't want to make that huge clock. So I replaced the clock with the wood block sound that you hear, the and then I used that as the basis for creating everything else. And then all the music is in, um, I was fascinated by kind of the binary structure of, of the creation narrative and much of the Bible, the way it's structured, light and dark, uh, sea and land, um, evil and good, you know, those things. And so I also composed it in two keys at the same time. It was in B flat and C major. And so at the beginning you got this sound. And then by the end of that first scene, it all resolved to here. And then it started the and that's the creation theme of, of life. And that comes back, if you noticed, in, uh, in the last film. It comes back when they go to, when we go to all the different colors and things, that theme comes back. But, um, and also, I guess we can take a minute to talk about instrumentation. So a lot of our ideas for the whole project was that we wanted to remain local, and we wanted to do everything cheap, and we could afford, and so, we immediately decided that we were going to use chamber ensembles instead of a full like orchestra or wind ensemble um, because it would be easier access and it also gave us some confines to work within. So th for this first film, it was five clarinets and, and, and a brass quintet. So wood, clarinet quintet, brass quintet, and that also reflects that binate structure. And they kind of are in these two different keys and they slowly merge throughout the rest of the piece. So that's the reason behind the instrumentation that you heard. Yeah, I mean, to, to address the concept of this film a little bit more, I guess what I think my original idea with this is it's almost like a, a satire of, of like pure creationism. Um, just like the idea of something being created fully um, like and completely from the very beginning. Um, a, um, so. Uh, it's a way of commenting on that uh, as well. Um, so it's, it's it's looking at like at like extreme creationists uh, and and that that seem to like completely try to find excuses around what uh, we observe in science versus 
um, like seeing science as a way of um, exploring what creation is. Um, and so that's all I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Mabel, yeah, let's jump on to Mabel. Um, so I'll just press play here and we'll jump on over there. We'll have a lot more time to talk during Mabel because it's more similar. Is it going to go by that forward? Oh, that was a good part. I like that. Okay. So um, all of these titles are handmade, uh, carved into stone. Um, actually, Ashley did them all, I think. Uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, like I, I believe I um, kind of gave her direction around what to, I want to see, but uh, she put that effort in. So that's, you know, it's a very much a collaborative effort. So press and play. Okay. All right, so um, I don't know, maybe you picked up on this or not, but this is uh, relating to the, um, the flood narrative and um, you know, with Noah's Ark and whatnot. Uh, but what I wanted to do here was to talk not about Noah and Ark and the two people and the, you know, the group of people that were saved, but all the innocents that, that, were, that were killed. And, and, um, there's a really poignant uh, illustration of, um, of the story of Noah's Ark where the, the flood's going up and there's all these animals that are still outside of the ark and they're just looking like kind of confused and a little worried and then uh, like it's uh, multiple panels and suddenly eventually they're, they're gone and they're completely obliterated. And so I wanted to explore that uh, through film. Um, but uh, for a lot of reasons, like using live animals for this uh, it really wasn't a, a good idea, <laughs> let's say. So I did explore it quite a lot. Trying this is to, where you wanted to do I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to, like, I don't know, ideally, I like, wanted to throw an entire giraffe in a giant tank of water. <coughs> and, like, I think that would have been really beautiful. That You can see an original uh, or a sketch of that outside uh, the Paul gallery. comes up to me and says, I think I want to throw a giraffe into a tank of water. And I was like, okay. He was like, I also want to do a lion. And I was like... <laughs> Okay, and he said, do you know where I can get a lion? And I said, well, and then I thought, and then there, there's actually a stuffed lion over at A&M Commerce that we use for the basketball games. Mm -hmm. And the last I heard was that Paul was like, I'm going to go talk to whoever I need to talk to to use that lion to put him in a tank of water. And I was like, I'm just writing the music. You go for it. <laughs> in retrospect, it was a terrible idea, obviously. Um, but we kind of we figured out like a way to do this. And so... Uh, we experimented with some different kinds of furs and stuff like that, but uh, rabbit fur like had just such a great quality to it. Um, and we'll skip that. Um, here I am out shooting uh, the scenes here, actually. <laughs> uh, and oh yeah, this is kind of a cool example. Like so, this is like experiments with the with the rabbit fur, trying to like figure out how to to make it look good at a faster rate. Please don't do that. Okay. Um, like how, how to slow that down. Oh my goodness. All right. How to slow down that rabbit fur so that it actually looks interesting. Um, and so at the time, I shot this um, almost two years ago, more than two years ago. Um, like uh, it would cost about like $40,000 to buy a camera that would do what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time experimenting with consumer level electronics, trying to figure out what the, you know, a way to actually achieve this um, through a lot of different camera tricks and stuff like that. Um, it, was, it was fun. Now you can buy an iPhone and it's built in. You can just do that automatically. So uh, you guys can all shoot this film if you want to easily. Um, <laughs> um, do I go sense. back? Yeah, let me go back. Oh yeah, so when we were shooting, when we were shooting those scenes back there with the with the rain and stuff like that. We just used like a water hose and pouring down. And but like it was freezing, and I was really was screaming like a girl, like and just like and then if you listen to the original audio from that video, it's just like oh, 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 oh. It's just it's ridiculous. Uh, it's really embarrassing. So. Um, but it was, and it was so fun, and, and so like when they're shaking and stuff like that, it's pretty much just me shaking. 
Um, saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the original saxophone quintet that read this piece. This was, gosh, this was, I guess, almost three players? years ago. Uh, they don't need to hear it. They already heard it. But um, that's our old saxophone professor over there on soprano sax. And so the idea here was that I wanted the musicians to actually drown with the with the animals. And so I wrote phrases that are way too long. And so that's why you heard breaks in the sound. And I told the musicians to like take gasping breaths when they breathe, but they got embarrassed and I don't think they did that. But uh, it's interesting, like when you watch Dr. Gornson over there on the far left, get ready to play that long high note, he's actually doing swimming, breathing exercises before he plays it. And then he begins playing it. It's pretty cool to watch him and he's like, And so, and then he goes. Um, <laughs> and so, anyway, the theme of this uh, comes out of just a three note motive. And then I invert it, so it comes back down. And then, it, and then you have stuff going on in canon. Or, and you have that basically going on like five different ways and you have it going on in different modes and everything. And it's interesting, it actually turns out mathematically when you look at the end of the score, it turns out to be like six, six notes of six phrases six times. So it creates this little six, six, six thing. And, um, and musically it's also created, the, the flood narrative is in a chiasmus, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Yeah, I'm um, slide for that later. Yeah. So the music reflects that too. When you hear flute, saxophone, and the saxophone um, music is actually a palindrome. It can be folded right on top of itself. So, and so can the flute part. So it all kind of just folds in on itself and then reverses through the other side. The, 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 the key, interesting, this is the source material, which is the, known as the Steiner Stinger. Does it, do you even know who Max Steiner is? He uh, wrote music for like Casablanca and all those big movies with Humphrey Bogart and all those guys in them. And every, like for example in Casablanca, uh, every time Bogart enters the scene, you hear that. And what's interesting is, is that it's actually a cluster chord. It sounds like that when you play it, but when you separate it by the octaves, it becomes actually kind of pleasant, to me anyway. And uh, that's what I use to create this tension. And so the, the saxophones are also in two different keys. And so that's kind of what creates that, the fact that the tonality never settles. I mean, um, I mean which I thought, I thought it was really interesting that the, the original Hebrew is written in a chiasmus as well. Yes. Right? Yeah, when you look at the numbers, you know, uh, seven days waiting, or seven days to load the ark, and then 40 days of the waters rising, 40 days, or 40 days of the waters rising, 120 days um, on the sea and then 40 days of the waters abiding, seven days on the mountaintop, something like that. The mountain, the numbers create this chiasmus. And in the middle, in the very middle of all that numbers, there's one phrase that says, but God remembered Noah. And so that's kind of like where that whole story points to, but God remembered Noah. So we tried to musically and thematically create that too. Right. Now we're in the... This whole part, silence, interestingly, like for some people, this was their favorite part of the whole night. And I was like, awesome. You love the part with no music. But it was kind of this, you know, John Cajian idea. And I, I'd struggled a long time to figure out what do I compose over this dead uh, animal? And so um, if you've ever been, like, of course, all of us have been to wakes or funerals or have even seen roadkill on the side of the road. And if you just, like stand there, everything is really, really still. I mean, really still. It's very eerie, very strange when you're that close to death, and so that's why we chose to keep it just silent. Do you guys have any questions or anything at this point? You can save it for the ending too. It's okay either way. It's okay. It's fine. Right. What's that? Did you say something? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, this is um, this is actually the first film that uh, I shot, and before I even like talked to Chris, I just I knew I wanted to make this film, and um, and so I just made a list of the shots that I wanted, 
and got together a couple people, um, and uh, we just shot this whole film in one day, basically, uh, just early in the morning till uh, late in the evening, and we took like a four-hour break in the middle of the day to just relax and go to soccer practice. So, um, and then and then we did go back and reshoot and shoot um, one more night, or like just for an hour, to get um, some of the mountaintop scenes. Um, that was a different day, but. Um, everything just came together so quickly and so beautifully. I was like, wow, making films is so easy. Um, and um, when, when Paul came to me, this was like way back in the day. This was about three or almost three and a half <laughs> so years ago. ago. And uh, he comes up to me and says, so I made this film. Can you compose some music for it? And in my mind, I'm like, my dream. I've always wanted to do that. Yes, absolutely. And he was like, great. You have, like, I'm presenting it in a week. And I was like, oh, OK. So um, <laughs> all of the music for Arcata was improvised. So I created a little cue sheet. And I wish I still had this cue sheet. It was on a scrap piece of paper that Josh Miller, the vocalist, I just said, we're going to do these things at this part in the movie. Let's do it. And so and and we basically. We spent a long time talking about it beforehand. We did. We talked about the, go ahead. And so you, you, you can bring it in. But um, to create the music for the original film, um, we had to improvise it in order to get it to Paul in time we, to record it and produce it and all that stuff. So all of it, and interesting, I mean, it kind of fits because Jewish music is mostly improvised and traditional. And then we also use the, the Jewish. That's that Hebrew kind of mode uh, that they use. And um, it was kind of so successful originally that we just decided that that piece is always going to be improvised whenever it's performed. So for the two live performances that we've had so far, it's been improvised. But you hit cues like tight as well. There's, there's certain yes. things that you you every time hit. And yes. You're very good about doing that. Um, you know the like here when they're going up, like hitting those footsteps as he's walking up the mountain here. You'll see in just a second. Um, after this. Which I guess this we can is, talk actually, about the really cue bars example. now. Like that. Yeah, so Paul, we were struggling a long time for the live aspect of this film. We we're just like, how are we going to line this up? And I was trying so hard. I was like studying second by second, trying to memorize the entire thing. And we got a Kata to work. And, and of we course, got, I like to re-edit it every like, few Yeah, days, he would send so. me new edits like every minute. And <laughs> so, so I was like, really great. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I was like, he, he said, what can I do to help you? I was like, well, if there's just something visual I could see, like a bullseye. And he was like, oh, I can do that. And I was like, oh, OK. And so he came back to me about a week later with these cue bars. Right, so it, you can see at the bottom of this screen here, these, these bars here. And they, what they do is they move across the screen at kind of a constant rate, and you know when they disappear, when they're closed, that's when uh, you have to like move to some important element of the uh, thing. So uh, other people seem to use like track. Uh, a lot of people use click tracks. Click tracks, thanks. You know, to, but the problem is a lot of this, because it was live and we were working with so many musicians, if I ever got off of the click track for whatever reason, because somebody was off, or just the live nature of performing music, I was terrified that that was just going to become a mess. Right. So this is kind of a way to like to be able to keep on, but also be able to diverge and, and then come back and, and recover. And the, you should see Chris like uh, in the live performance. I don't know if it happened much in this last one, but you know he'll he'll like he'll just really speed up to like catch <laughs> yeah. the next the next cue, and and, and it's and there the, it's really great <laughs> to watch uh, the intensity there. So here's another example of that cue bar. That's how I like originally edited it, and then I move it down to the bottom. Uh, the end, so that um, so that we kind of can see that happening. Um, wait, do we want to go back and talk about this a little bit? Sure, a little bit stuff with the film. Oh, okay, that's okay. We'll okay. pause it. So this is kind of one of the. Oh, did we we skipped? Man, we you know what? Let's come back to this later. Where's um? Where's our? Should be right here. Sorry. But this is out of order or something. All right, here we go. Let's play. 
in case so Abram rose and clave the wood and went and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac, the firstborn, spake and said, My father, behold the preparation of fire and iron. You guys can't hear it? Okay. Basically, it's a poem by Wilfred Owen that that Paul kind of began with for this film. Right. This, yeah, this, and it's inspired some other um, sculptural works I've done in the past. But um, the the idea of um, of in World War uh, to the the idea of these or World War One. World War One. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, like of these these. Uh, fathers that that send their sons off to war, and and these and basically as a sacrifice, uh, and and taking this traditional story from the Bible and distorting it, and and shaping it to tell another story, um, that's that's kind of like was an eye-opening experience for me when I was younger to to read that story and and really like see how you can tell one story by telling another story, and and that's what this whole this whole film series is about is telling saying one thing by telling a traditional uh, narrative. Um, so, where are we? Jericho. We're going, we're going to just move on to Jericho. Okay. Okay, and we can talk about the archetypal mm -hmm. element. Also, um, are we just playing? Should I pause? Oh, no, we're good. Um, you know, we tried, you know, with the, the carrying of the um, the wood and with the, the symbolism of the red shirt, um, we're trying to like talk about how um, Isaac is kind of like an archetype for Jesus as well. So um, hopefully that symbolism is not totally lost as well in there. Um, are there some other elements I'm forgetting? No. Okay, we'll just keep going. Cool. Um, Um, so I'll just go ahead and we'll start talking about this next one. So this collaboration process definitely applies to this project because um, walking into, basically the way I, I shot this film was completely um, just my neighbors across the street uh, were, you know, they're in a completely different socioeconomic situation than I am. Uh, and I, I wanted to, you know, when I did, um, when I did the first film, I actually worked under a pseudonym of uh, Abraham Goldstein. I wanted to like to hide behind this I idea of like a, a, this professor and who's much smarter than I am, so I can make this film seem more important. Uh, but you know, a lot of my professors were just really against it and pushed me to being to making films authentically as like who I am. Um, and so that's what this is kind of a response to this, like, oh, how do you make a film as a Christian? Uh, and to me, Christianity is all about connecting with people, like, and being part of a community, and, um, and like, and reaching out to people that, the widows and unfortunate, and, 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 man, they were literally, like, right there next to me every day. And every time I, like, ignored them or, or told them I was too busy to help them and give them a ride, that it really kind of was, like, you know, I'm, I'm way too busy. I'm a student and I'm working full time. I don't have time to do that. Uh, and so a big part of this process was like stopping and, and spending time with uh, these people and, and walking, going into their houses and saying, hey, let me, can I, can I, can I film you for this project? And um, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that they were so welcoming, you know, to let me take their children out <laughs> into the rain in the middle of the winter. <laughs> And uh, and film them, uh, you know, just pour water on them. Uh, I mean, they they were having a great time. But if I was a mom, I would not be into that at all. So yeah, this I feel like this this film like to me embodies like community and and like kind of connecting us together. And like it was really great to see this whole neighborhood come out and be part of this. Somebody, everybody was holding some water or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, Chris came out and was part of the shooting as well, I think. It was really cool. I was kind of an instrument guy to make sure that everybody was holding the instruments correctly so that I would be satisfied when I saw the final film. And uh, the kid who's playing the trumpet, you saw him just a second ago, he, uh, very interesting. My other major is in music education, and uh, him right there. 
I took the trumpet. I was like, you're going you're gonna to play the trumpet for this scene. He was like, oh, okay. And so he took the trumpet in his hands, and he stopped. I was like, let's go. And he was like, and, and he just stood there. And I was like, what, what's going on? And he said, it's been my dream to play the trumpet my whole life. And I was just, I was so just like, oh, my gosh. And commerce is a town where it has a very low socioeconomic uh, background and a lot of kids just don't have access to music lessons they don't have access to instruments and so to have that experience um, it's pretty powerful um, yeah, so and then um, this older lady that's here um, you know she lives across she lives across the street with us for a long time um, and she would always I mean she was she was really crazy I mean just really uh, <laughs> We were just, but we actually would just laugh about it. It's just, uh, she would just come over and ask us to do like just the weirdest things that didn't make any sense at all. Um, and I think at, like one point she got, she like bought astroturf and like astroturfed her front lawn, um, which <laughs> it's still there. Uh, but she passed away uh, a few months ago, and um, so that that kind of adds an interesting significance to this for me. Uh, and. Um, but she just let us come in, and she just loved to talk to me. And so I have hours of film of her talking to me about her life and things like that as well, um, which perhaps will develop into something someday. Um, this is so the the puppets, I guess, would be an interesting thing to talk about. Um, you can see the the real live puppets that I used in the gallery uh, in there, and. Um, what I did is just cut out uh, pieces of paper and sewed them together with string just so that they were loose and then uh, connected dowels to those. And uh, Ashley and I both took turns kind of controlling those puppets uh, at different times. Um, you can, I don't know if they're in here right now. Yeah, so there they go. And um, I wanted to, to, to basically talk about like the, this, this fantasy world that this little girl is kind of going into um, under, to, to understand the, the, what's happening around her. And, um, and this may be one of the more difficult films to, to, to kind of grasp the, the meaning behind, but it's, it's from the story of Jericho, uh, but also it's talking about um, uh, Katrina and the, you know, the great flood that happened in that situation. And, um, and the, the country's kind of response to that. Um, you know, I was just really shocked to hear Christians talk about um, New Orleans as this, this place of sin and that should be washed away. And um, I mean, the, how in, um, like how just not humanizing that is and uh, to, to dismiss the people that are there. Uh, and then, you know, to actually see the aftermath of that, you know, you, I think uh, it's, it really drove that home. So I'm commenting on that, I, the idea of Christianity and, and, and perhaps some of the failures that we have in that, um, and, and relating, uh, relating that to um, the wall of Jericho and, and the people inside of there who were, who were innocent and being, come and being destroyed by the hand of God. As well, so you kind of you kind of see um, kind of a, a blaming of God in, in in Katrina that like you know he if he's all powerful then he could have stopped all the suffering and it speaks to suffering as a larger in a larger um, sense. Um, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, musically, I I was inspired by the New Orleans funeral. Uh, style that they do. And when I was in New Orleans, I actually got to see one pass by. It was really cool. Um, and so they have this thing that they do. Uh, let's choose a different key. And they just go, ba we da And then everybody will like shout. And then, so, and then the clarinet player will go, ba we da And then everybody will just shout. And it was, it was so interesting that there's this kind of just call and response. And so I, I incorporated that, that minor third into the music a lot. And for source material, I chose Wayfaring Stranger and St. James Infirmary, which are both, you go down to New Orleans and you'll hear that on the street corner. 
Um, and so we have this kind of, in the, the funeral, the New Orleans funeral, you have the dirge, which is the, the trip to the cemetery, where every, it's this kind of slow, and they're playing, you know, these slower tunes, and everybody's crying and wailing, and then you get to the cemetery and the burial, and then they, like, kick up this party, and it's like this raucous, crazy, everybody's dancing and having a good time, and so that's kind of the middle of this, where it kind of gets into this crazed, and it gets really loud, and, it, and I have both melodies from both songs going on at the same time, and the percussion, the, the set player, he's just kind of banging on things, and... Um, so that's why I chose those tunes. I wanted it to be in a jazz style. So a lot of those, the music wasn't improvised, but a lot of the inflections were, they were really good jazz players who were playing that. So, yeah. Wow, I'm a little out of order here. So here's the original sketch for the, the concept of um, Jericho, which is in the gallery right now as well. Um, here's an animation. I, I was originally going to try doing some animation. Uh, here's the lady that, um, and there's the, um, the little house that uh, actually actually made this house completely and did all the little shingles on that and everything. It was uh, really amazing and then we completely destroyed it, uh, and then brought it back to life a little bit. And uh, that's the scene that we shot with the, um, you see it just for a second, where the, the tr it's almost like a fiddler on the roof kind of situation there. Um, and what else? I was going to say something else about that. Oh, well. Musically, this didn't get to happen in the performance here, but with the scene where the house gets blown down, obviously there's the huge trumpet blast, which is hearkening back to the story of Jericho. Um, and my lead trumpet player, great friend, he had just um, had an embouchure change, which if you know what that means, it, he had to move his mouthpiece and basically destroyed his range, and so he couldn't hit that high note. So I was like, what can I do? And then I just grabbed a bunch of trumpet players in the hallway the day before the performance and said, hey, you wanna be part of this? They were like, sure. I said, get up in the balcony, and when I point to you, just wail out a high C as loud as you can and then until you can't and just let it fall. And so it was really cool in the actual performance that you hear here. Um, I, like when that time came, I turned around on the piano bench and I was like, go! And then just this wall of trumpet sound just enveloped the whole audience. It was, it was pretty cool to hear that coming from like all around. It's pretty powerful. Can't imagine what Definitely. the Jerichites experienced. If that's what, how you call them. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is I use, uh, I use projectors a lot in my um, filmmaking. Um, the scenes uh, where the girl's looking out the window and stuff like that, that's um, all with a projector. You can't really get that kind of uh, directional light any other way that I've found. Um, and, so, and then also to get really sharp shadows and things like that uh, with my shadow puppets. And that's an, another really interesting, fun technique. Is, and then you can, with a projector, you can have any color of light you want or any shape of light you want or anything. So that's really uh, a, a really fun tool to have. Um, and so moving on to the next one. Sure. You good? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. That would have been embarrassing. Once again, we have these uh, things. So here's my setup that I'm building, I built for the, um, boy, everything's out of order. I don't know what happened to my slides. It's embarrassing. Um, so this is kind of my setup. This is my setup for this uh, original scenes here. Um, where, and then here we are painting uh, all the little animals. Um, we ended up not using the pigs because they're not kosher. Oh. And, um, <laughs> And so here, that this scene here is was here's like the shooting of that scene here. Um, so I'm setting up this camera on a track, and then um, using a rear, uh, you know, what traditionally you use a rear projector, but now computer screens have gotten so big that you can really get away with using a computer screen if you have a little bit of focus play. So I'm just going to pause this for a second, um, and and so. Um, 
one of my heroes is uh, Ray Harryhausen, who um, has done some pretty amazing uh, stop frame animation and stuff like that. Uh, here's him, uh, you know, he did uh, Clash of the Titans, uh, it was like probably the biggest film he did. Um, and uh, this is from the um, Simbad's Golden Voyage. I don't know if you, you guys seen those movies. They're, they're pretty, they're amazing. So uh, yeah, here's, and so what he would do is he would set up a projector behind the, the object and then a project on it and then set up the, the, uh, the, the model and then um, kind of mask out the foreground even uh, in order to, to incorporate that into the scene. So that I kind of tried to do that with this. That's what I did here. Uh, well, that's not a good example. But here I took um, like a, a night scene of, of lightning and put it behind this. And then uh, I was able to do color shift to in, of the actual picture in the background to match the, um, the foreground elements. And well, I'm talking a lot about this really short shot, but it was, <laughs> I spent so much time on these stupid little shots. Um, and then this is a, um, like a giant motorized um, copy desk, which I have no idea why anyone would build such an elaborately, overly strong object, but I was able to pick it up and turn it on its side and turn it upside down so the camera's mounted upside down, and so it, it could very smoothly move in and get um, that shot that you saw there at the beginning with the lightning and stuff like that. So I've dwelled enough on this shot, we'll move on. Um, so here's the barber shot. What's that? <laughs> oh, perfect. That one, sorry. <laughs> what is it? Barbor. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. So yeah, the barber shop was great. It was just a friend of ours um, from church, and we were able to just pull together some people. It's, it was very similar to the way we shot the, the first film, Abraham uh, and Isaac. And so, um, but you know, really, the guerrilla style, like by the seat of your pants kind of shooting, is like what I really love to do, and just to to try to pull things together and how happenstance kind of brings together. So, um, which you got to really know how to use your equipment well <laughs> to do that too, and be ready to go. But um, I was at, like the the um, the devil character. I just went out on the street. I just kind of really needed somebody else because our main actor that was going to come and do that wasn't showing up. And this guy was just coming out of um, the Chinese restaurant on his way home. I said, oh, would you just come over and do this? It'll just take five minutes. Be an extra. It's no big deal. Ended up being like the main character in the scene uh, and didn't have a clue how to play chess. I don't know how you live to be 70 years old and not how to play chess. but. Uh, so we were kind of trying to teach him <laughs> that as we went, but it was it was super fun. Um, there's also an antique store that uh, is nearby that I was able to borrow a lot of props and stuff from, and he would just yeah you know, just bring it back next week. It's fine, and it was, that was really amazing. All the trumpets and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff came from him, and I uh, didn't tell him that we got him soaked. Musically here, yeah. so this is where you heard the strange. <laughs> And so I got my good friend, who was the first, first chair clarinet player, I said, come over, I'll feed you, we'll give you tea or beer or whatever you want, and uh, I need to find out what the clarinet can do. And so basically we just spent all night, just he was doing harmonics and trying to play like two notes at one time and doing all these different things, and we came up with all these extended techniques to make these strange sounds. And that, that you hear is actually, you take the barrel and the mouthpiece and you stick your finger in and out of it and it creates that kind of whale siren sound. And the source music for that, so you have the scenes with, in the barber shop, which is uh, a Baroque setting, a very uh, strict style of a piece by John Dowland called uh, Flow My Tears and it's back from 15, in the 1580s is when it was written. It's one of the most famous sad songs ever written and I just love the lyrics and I was captivated by it so I just decided to use, to set it for this and so you have you know that kind of strict setting juxtaposed with this free all I did was this and then the clarinet players just kind of did their thing and they did it in their own timing and so again we kind of see the return of this binary 
structure of the music. Is there anything else you wanted to say here? Uh, I was going to talk about, yeah, this scene was kind of a crazy one. We kind of just put out a message on Facebook, like, hey, does anybody want to be in a film or whatever? And uh, some people showed up, and they were in a party scene. Um, and so we, we set up this, we built, I built this, like, um, contraption, which is like a, a ceiling above that was just made out of styrofoam and then Ashley <laughs> above, above it. And so I'm like, I'm moving the camera in on a track and, and trying to like very quickly move in so that we could slow that down to a, a slow pan in. Um, while Ashley beats on the top of this thing with a, um, what do you call it, with a two by four. <laughs> and she ended up hit our friend in the head pretty hard. So you know, be careful volunteering for anything that we're involved well, with. Well, anytime you volunteer for Paul, yeah. yeah you're going to end up doing you're something. You're going to get wet in the cold, or you're going to get hit in the head. Um, you're going to find a giraffe foam. in a tank. Right. Um, do you want to say anything more about the music in this? I'm yeah, and so in this last piece, to finish out this chiasmus idea, the whole, uh, all five films are set in a chiasmus, and the musicians are too. And so the last film is the return of the exact same ensemble from the creation film. So you have the five clarinets and the five brass members, plus a coda of the vocalist and the flute player. And so, um, you know, putting the live music together was a little bit of an insomnia inducer. Um, but it was really cool, and it was really great to work with those guys on stage in a way that none of them had ever worked before, that we hadn't worked before, and to create the experience live. I mean, that was kind of the whole point of believe it anyway, and kind of this layered ideas that we have about belief and what you see and what you don't see and what's going on. And the, the musicians had so many ideas to bring to the table. They were just as much as part of the project as the extras, and, and I mean, they probably didn't stay up as many late nights as Paul did you know, editing things, but they practiced a lot. Yeah, well, um, so yeah, the, the whole idea of Job is an interesting, uh, uh, kind of coming out at the end, we, how to end this piece, we, we really talked about a lot, you know, we had um, the, the um, story of the dry bones coming to life was one that I originally wanted to do, I wanted to do it in the Way in a style of like a Hellraiser kind of um, scenario. Uh, I really love those kind of uh, really gory uh, horror movies, and I'd love to recreate those as a biblical story. I think that'd be really fun uh, someday, maybe. But and uh, what else were we gonna do? There's one other. Thing we're gonna do about. David and Bathsheba. Oh yeah, David and Bathsheba had a um, actually had a rap written for it and everything. But we wanted we decided we didn't want to have vocals in in this piece so much. And um, and it was it was a pretty explicit rap, uh, so the it may not have reached out to as wide an audience, um, but yeah. So the story of Job, though, really, the it almost embodies what this whole this whole series is 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 suffering and questioning and 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 doubt uh, throughout all of these stories that, that you you see the, the and then. And asking God, like, why? Why is this? Why is there? Why is there pain in this world? And um, and then Job. I mean, and then God coming back and responding, um, "Who are you to ask that? I'm God, and I've made everything. And and you don't understand everything there is to understand about the situation, and you never can. Um, and which is extremely unsatisfactory answer to hear. <laughs> um, but. Uh, but it's the answer that God gave them, and so, um, so that's how we thought to end this as well as and yeah. And this this scene here is, uh, would you want sure? Okay, so, Paul showed me the the powers of ten video, which is where, you know, it starts with the picnickers and it zooms all the way in to the smallest unit, and then it zooms all the way out to the universe, and kind of this really cool idea of going in and out and, and kind of putting things in perspective. And so we kind of tried to recreate a lot of those ideas visually and musically. I tried to kind of set it in motion and we have the recurrence of all the previous themes in the film uh, at the same time. And kind of this idea that like for scientists 
to understand the beginning of the universe, to understand where everything came from. They had to listen to cosmic background radiation coming from the farthest reaches of the universe in order to discover that. And then now scientists are looking into the absolute smallest particles in the universe in order to understand the beginning of the universe again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we kind of recreated these, tried to recreate, and when you think about the way that like cells and blood vessels look and you compare that to the way like planets move and things like that, it's eerily similar. Um, so, so yeah, visually I wanted to try to draw some parallels between like a universe and then like cellular activity and like just the tiniest thing in the world and the biggest thing in the world. Um, and uh, so all this sh is shot um, with just a um, macro bellows and um, a, I went too, way too far, um, and then just uh, glycerin and glitter and, and things like that. And so it's just like, it's basically things out of our kitchen that, uh, and actually really, like was a big part of that and like and being part of it. And so we were together, I was manning the camera and, um, and what I found was like if I ma created a mount where the camera and the, and the, oh, that's definitely the wrong button, oh well. Um, the, the camera and the, the plate of, of goo <laughs> and it was uh, all mounted on the same contraption then I could just move the whole thing as one large, extremely heavy piece, uh, and then and keep the same focal distance and all that kind of thing. Uh, and so I'm like tilting this thing at a 45 degree angle, like, uh, and, and trying to hold it in place while this glycerin's moving at an extremely slow pace. So all that stuff is sped up quite a lot. Um, and that's all I have to say. You have. Yeah, you know, the, the piece kind of, this is probably the last thing we talk about, but the piece kind of started with, uh, it started, we almost showed you this slide of, you saw Pastor Steve Munze oh, yeah. up there. He has this sermon called Believe It Anyway, where he talks about these things that happen in the Bible and the, the congregation, see, like, chants, believe it anyway, believe it anyway, believe it anyway, believe it anyway, and it was just like, well, this is like too much for me to handle right now because... We both grew up in, in Christian traditions, and um, all of a sudden I was struck with, like, wait a minute, what do I believe, um, and why do I believe it? And so kind of this project was our way of, of working through those questions to, um, you know, like, okay, so why would God send Hurricane Katrina into New Orleans, right? In the same way, why would he decide to destroy the entire city of Jericho so that the Israelites can come in and take it over and you know, killing women, children, men. And these are hard, difficult questions for us to wrestle with. So kind of creating this helped us to work through those questions. And like Paul said, at the, at the end, you don't necessarily get the answer that you're seeking. And we haven't, the journey's not over yet, obviously. Like, it's never over. And you're always seeking answers to questions about life. Um, but the last uh, things that we were thinking about was just like, what, well, how did Job respond when everything was taken from him, and including his health, including his family, you know, he didn't respond happily. He didn't say, oh, well, okay. You know, he was saying, uh, I have it written here, you know, the light, they say, is near top the darkness. If I hope for Sheol, which is, is like death and blackness and nothingness, if I hope for Sheol as my house, if I make my bed in darkness, if I say to the pit, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother or my sister, where then is my hope? Who will see my hope? Will it go down to the bars of Sheol? Shall we descend together into the dust? Like, that's what Job said. And, like, he turned out, you know... God said, you know, this is the most righteous man on earth. Um, so anyway, things like that. And the, the last thing that I, I wrote down was also from Job. It, it's actually his friend who says, how then can man be the right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? 
Behold, even the moon is not bright, and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man who is a maggot, and the son of man who is a worm. And obviously our last scene is of, of that worm, you know, kind of just struggling around. Yeah, reaching out, still questioning. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so a hopeful ending that we put there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I feel, I feel like, you know, speak frankly like, that by um, taking on these kind of questions and and not, uh, you know, pushing them aside, uh, I think that I feel stronger in my faith in a way, um, and um, not as strong as I'd like to be certainly. But um, it, it's, you know, it's it's dealing with the really the really difficult stuff, uh, and um, you know, different things may be difficult for different people, but this has certainly, um, you know, made me really take time to think about these things instead of, and, and to act them out physically, to take a boy and walk up to the top of a mountain with him and when he's cold and miserable and, and crying a little bit, to be honest, and, and, and his mom was there. She said he was fine. <laughs> but, I mean, it didn't make it any less intense. To do that, that makes the story so real and so, I mean, it all, that, I think that, that level of, like, experience was, like, something that only I probably got. I don't think that that's conveyed probably through the film itself um, to that level. But for me, it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a journey in faith to, to create these things uh, as well as to share them. So, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Anything? Yes. It's a beautiful film and, uh, and a delight. And the first time I saw it was in the uh, New Works room. And I was thinking about it uh, as, a, as a gallery film. My question is to the matter of it being a gallery film. Uh, so many uh, films and videos that I see artists make uh, in galleries uh, involve a rather static frame of reference. Uh, and the narrative is a process or a task that the artist is doing. And there's impressive cargo in this type of thing. Your scope is so much bigger and, and so much different. I wonder, are you cognizant of, of uh, other art movies and galleries, or uh, were you just making something? Were you, did, you, did you have a venue uh, in mind for what you were going to do uh, ultimately with the, the, the piece once it was finished? Yes. Um, I, I would certainly, just before I made the, the first film, I, I saw um, Next Floor, um, which is a film, uh, it's a European film. and. It's just like a 15-minute uh, short, and it's uh, and I saw that at the the Horshorn Gallery and and shown in a similar way, and um, and that was a great. It was a really intense experience for me, and really opened my eyes. Like uh, the production value, the the you know the tension to that, and then and then how it's shown only in that in that situation. There was no way for me to even share it with somebody else. It was it was so powerful. Um, in that, and it, it can buy it on iTunes now. But um, that um, that experience was kind of, you know, I certainly was thinking about how this could end up in a gallery um, in that kind of situation. Um, and so, and but that was a theatrical kind of uh, element, that, but it still had that looping uh, quality to it. So, and I watched it a number of times. To, you know, because it was so powerful to me. Um, but right after, very soon after I made the first one, uh, I started talking to Lisa uh, about it. She, um, and we discussed the, like, the structure of how that would work. And, um, and I wanted to, to create an environment where you kind of had that experience. So the, the, the stone um, seats that you sit on, those are, you know, hopefully you, you have that, you put your hands on that and you, you, you know, that's the same exact stones that I used for the altar of, um, uh, with Abraham and Isaac, and uh, some of them, obviously not all of them, but uh, some of those that are on the top are the exact same stones that I used. And so to put yourself in that situation and to create a space that is, um, that, that hopefully is contemplative and um, and a little bit chapel-like uh, is what my goal was, um, and so yeah, building we you know we built those walls 
to go in and, and so you have a, a, some stations to experience before you get there to prime you and get you in the mindset to experience this hopefully. Um, so yeah, those were some thoughts that I had before. Beforehand. Did you did you get that experience at all? Oh, oh, I'm curious. So. Okay. Now, I've got a lot of sketching, but I, I don't have anything I'm shooting right now. Um, I'm working on a documentary about um, circumcision, and, but um, it's a little bit of a satire because we're talking about cutting off the people's thumb, baby's thumbs instead of penises. Um, and so that's, and we're um, trying to figure out how to create uh, little silicone thumbs and uh, with little bones sticking out and stuff like that. So it's fun. It, I'm trying to, one thing that, about this project that after I finished, I was just like, I gotta do something fun because this was <laughs> pretty heavy for me. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's hard on, on you to, to deal with these heavy ideas all the time. So I'm, I'm really interested in kittens. Uh, and so I think kittens are gonna be a big part of uh, my future work as well. This process of sketches to maniacal, obsessive manifestation, it seems like it's a consistent process for you. I mean, it starts kind of vague with these sketches and then... Yeah, I do sketches because I have to. I'm supposed to, I guess. I think, like, um, you know, because if you're in art school, you're supposed to, you're supposed to draw first. So that's why I make myself do that. And then a lot of the sketches I do after the film is even in, in like, and so some of them are responses to the film and some of them are planning for the film. Uh, certainly the, the, like the deer and the bird, those, those were certainly, um, those informed the film a lot. But, um, but there are some sketches I did like after I shot the film that, that you know, that were formed by my experience of, of creating it. And some are actually, um, you know, drawn directly from looking at the, the st film stills. Uh, just as a, I don't know, it's just, I think the, you just wanna keep, keep on responding to your, the, the ideas. What's your process? Is it just a vague kind of crazy thoughts that you that start experimenting with and it slowly grows into a, a thing? Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> um, no, because I, I um, and, and there's so many different kinds of shooting that I do, like when I'm working with people, um, it's that's a completely different process than working in a studio with, with um, puppets and, and stuff like that and, and silicone <laughs> or whatever. It's like, it's just a totally different uh, experience. So. Um, and, and that's that's more experimentative and and harder to do for me to but like um, there's this there's this really manic quality to the creation that happens with with people around you you know you you have to be a thousand places at once in your mind uh, and trying to pull everything together and because every no I don't I'm not paying anybody on this stuff uh, they're all I mean I did pay some people a little bit after but they didn't know that. They were going to, but you know, you're you're trying you're trying not to use their time too much, and, and to really get the shot the very first time, and um, and so what I do with those kind of things is I just I have a list of ideas uh, of shots that I have in my mind, uh, because I feel like if I sketch something out, a lot of times I'll end up trying to like spend too much time trying to get that shot instead of the shot that organically happens, and that's those are the ones I'm more happy with usually. Uh, the, the organic um, one. So, um, you know, the Jericho and Abraham are two really interesting ones to compare um, because the, the shooting style is so drastically different. Um, but with uh, the cinema verite kind of style with um, Jericho, um, you know, that was that was extremely chaotic situation to be shooting at night with water and 
electricity <laughs> mixed together and, um, and children. <laughs> so um, that, yeah, that experience is, it's, it's a very aerobic experience, I guess, <laughs> in a way. And, um, and just balancing all, a lot of different elements. And, but it's, it's fun, but it's so stressful. You know, don't sleep the night before at all kind of thing. Um, and what I, would, what I would do is shoot that until a reasonably late time, like 9.30 or something like that, when the kids have to go to bed, and then I would go back to my studio and edit all night, and then, then I would know what I needed for the next day, and I would bring them back in and we shoot that. And that was done over about a week's time to get those. Um, yeah, did I answer your question? Cool. To the aerobic nature of that, to like even musically, Paul would create something. I would write to it, send it back to Paul. Paul recuts the film, sends that back to me. It's like, oh, I need to change this. I rewrite it, get the musicians together, play it. Paul gets it. He cuts it. He sends it back to me. I said, oh, no, this needs to be changed. And we did this. Oh, I, I think we got mad a lot of times, not necessarily at each other, no, but no. just like, when is this going to be done? And it's still not done. We're Thank still goodness for changes. Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we were just thinking, oh man, we could maybe change that part a little bit. And edit that. Um, well, it's our film. Do that. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I did. Uh, for some of the improvisational quality of, of, of what you just described, I mean, there's uh, the, some wonderful cinematic uh, uh, value and content to, to every one of these shots, it seems, and to the film. Uh, is your background? Uh, as a, as a film student uh, in photography, or uh, I noticed that uh, Texas is a, a film savvy state. There is uh, commercial work and industrial work, lots of folks with know how. Uh, did you pick up, well, how basically did you study? Did you work in the industry for a time? Kind of uh, uh, just, yeah, I'm a photographer by, you know, from since I was in high school, and, um, and then uh, I got a job. At, a universe, at the Texas A&M University of Commerce. And so um, kind of leading up to when I started shooting this film, I was working as a photographer shooting mostly pretty boring stuff of like just, you know, somebody's head cropped like this talking. And um, uh, some, some exciting stuff. And I uh, worked with uh, Jason Flowers a lot. And I learned a lot from him, just like I hired him to work with me. And because I knew nothing about film. and so. I would say most of what I learned about the technical side um, and some of the um, aesthetic side as well of how to treat film, uh, how to edit film, I picked up just by stealing that from, from Jason. Um, and I shot one film right before this uh, called uh, Ritual, which, um, which it was all in studio. And, and I was watching it again actually last night. I was like, oh, well, it's not that bad actually. And for a very first film ever shot. So this was basically the second film that I ever did. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it's, I just thought about it a lot. And um, I'm very, um, I don't know, I'm just really obsessed. And I, I watch all the extras on every single <laughs> DVD. And <laughs> Ashley's shaking her head, so I'm super annoyed. But yeah, like, I just like, and I'll pause like the, and, like, I'll pause like the, the extras, like when they show the behind the scenes of like, of like the setup for like the film and like, oh, that's what they're using to get that shot. Okay. And like, and so that's I'm just constantly trying to soak that up. Um, uh, but like the tracking shots and stuff like that and the, and uh, Akeda, they're, those are just PVC pipes that we put on the ground and then just roller skate type set up on top of that. You've seen that a million times. So it's, it's it's not a big deal. You also a blanket on top of under that to keep the grass from coming on top of the PVC pipe and giving you grass bumps. Um, so yeah, you know grass bumps. That's the worst. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's just about like for me, just like just trying things a lot and um, but yeah, I think working in the industry a little bit. I wouldn't call it the industry. We're just shooting for a school. It's not as, it's not like, it doesn't feel like a big deal because we're not working with clients and stuff like that as much. But of course, there's no way I could have done this without learning a little bit. Yeah, I would say that that's like the main thing I do. (laughs) 
yeah. I watch I watch everything I can. Uh, I try. I'm like, like I don't have any problems with alcohol really or um, drugs at all. Like really haven't had an issue. But watching movies has been a major issue for me. <laughs> major uh, addiction and you know like. But I don't know. And, and I have to kind of give myself a break a little bit though because like right before I did like some major edits on some of these things, I know I'll watch like all the Godfather movies. And then I can't, I can't pretend like doing that didn't inform the way that I actually, um, you know, cut those films and, you know, to some level, like it's, I think you soak up and you're the sum of your experiences. So yeah, I try to have as many good experiences cinematically as possible. Um, you know, Lars von Trier, uh, you know, I think that his, his style really informed the Jericho piece a lot. Um, so, 